Hi, welcome to the video. My name is Upal and on behalf of my amazing co-authors Ranjit, Jake and Mark, I'm excited to present the key highlights of our paper on the algorithmic imprint. By the end of this video, I hope it will add a new dimension to how you think about the impact of algorithms. So let's get started. Our story begins in 2020 when due to COVID-19, in-person exams for the GCA levels, which is a UK-based exam, gets canceled. So instead of the real exams, the boards introduced an algorithm to grade as an alternative assessment. However, once grades were released, protests broke out, and you may have actually run into coverage from the UK that looked something like this. But did you know that the GC exams are actually administered in over 160 countries globally, many of them being Commonwealth countries? How many of us are aware of the events in countries other than the UK? Which is where the focus is for this paper. It's in Bangladesh, a country in South Asia. Now you may wonder why Bangladesh, three main reasons. First, there's a dearth of coverage in non-UK settings despite Commonwealth countries having a substantial share of these uh, exams. Second, it provides a unique opportunity to understand how algorithms made in the global north can actually impact stakeholders in the global south who may have less voice in the process. Third, and at a personal level, as a Bangladeshi and a product of this GCE education system, I wanted to ensure that the Bangladeshi side is not erased from the overall narrative. Now, coming back to the events. On the surface, it appears that everything is going well. The protests led to the board's reversing course, implying the removal of the algorithm's effect. But this is where our paper kicks in and asks the critical question. Was that really the case? Did the removal of the algorithmic standardization undo its effect? We don't think so. And to help with our argument, we introduce the concept called the algorithmic imprint to illustrate how merely stopping an algorithmic deployment does not necessarily undo its effect. And a metaphor here can be useful. This is, these are pictures of what we call palimpsests. So without getting into the deeper art history of it, broadly speaking, palimpsests are manuscripts or scrolls where old text is erased to make room for new text, but most importantly, the traces of which remain. The picture on the left shows that there could be multiple lower texts, you know, from the 8th century and the uh, 6th century. And just like palimpsest, um, algorithms can leave hard imprints on society instead of papers, even though the algorithms are made of software, something we think that could be easily mutable or reversible. But as we will see in this paper, like the remnant traces are hard to raise on a palimpsest, it's actually very hard to raise an undo algorithmic effects. In short, there is no undo button. So by the end of this presentation, we'll learn about three things. First, we'll learn about what happened in Bangladesh through the first coherent timeline around the 2020 events. Second, we will learn through these events what this algorithmic imprint is about and how it lets us explore an area that we haven't had a chance to do it before, the algorithm's afterlife. Third, we will learn about the implications of this and how an imprint-aware design mindset can help us. Now, here is the brief roadmap for the rest of the talk, and we'll start with backgrounds. When it comes to background, there are two things to learn. First, what are these GC exams? They are international exams that evaluate a high school student's competency. There are two types of exams, O-levels and A-levels, and our focus today is on the A-levels. Both of these exams are actually administered by two boards, Edexcel and Cambridge, and our focus today is on Cambridge, or CIE. These boards are actually governed by an agency or a department called OFQUAL, or the Office of Qualification Exam Regulations in the UK. Something to keep in mind that the Commonwealth nations, which are ex-British colonies, form a significant portion of the global market share for these GC exams. Second thing about the background is to understand why these A-level uh, exams are so important. So put bluntly, A-levels are the most important exam of a high schooler's life given its importance in university placements locally and internationally. But the global acceptance of A-levels can carry a very complex colonial dimension and this student highlights it beautifully. It, and I quote, 
It feels like I'm paying money to my ex-colonizer for a piece of certificate that tells the world I'm no dumber than a local UK kid. Sometimes it's hard to ignore that reality. Now, before we get to the events, let's talk a little bit about the methods. So when it comes to methods, this project captures more than a year-long community engagement, reporting 47 interviews with 33 students and 14 teachers taken from July 2021. However, since September of 2020, we have actually had more than 100 informal conversations. Since this was not an easy-to-access community, uh, these conversations helped gain community trust and engagement. There are two rounds of interviews, one that happened towards the start of the project and one that happened towards the end. Now, with the methods in mind, let's talk how, what happened, let's stitch the timeline. And to help with chronicling the events, which span a period of five months from March to August of 2020, we have split the timeline into four acts covering different events from exam cancellations to alternative assessments, the results of the protests and the revision of the grades. As I chronicle each act, I'll share its relevant to the imprint. Let's get started with the first act. So in this act, there are two things to note. First, on March 20th, Cambridge or CIE canceled the exams, but only in the UK, making Bangladeshi students feel rather alienated. Second, after facing backlash on March 23rd, the exams were canceled globally. The thing to remember here is these are actually the preconditions that can make the algorithm possible. So paying attention to these preconditions actually helps us understand the imprint later on. Now we switch to Act 2, which focuses on alternative assessment. So this is the most action-packed and the longest act running from April to August, and the focal point is alternative assessments. The students would be evaluated along three dimensions. A teacher assessed grades based on their past performance, their ranking for each subject, and an algorithmic standardization. Now let's go over each of this. First, on teacher assist grade. Well, how do you make up for a real in-person exam? Well, you may wonder that you can use past classwork, mock exams, and grades. And in theory, it sounds good till you start considering that there are the differences in cultural practices as this teacher beautifully points out. This is where the main disconnect happens. The UK folks have no idea of the culture of learning in Bangladesh. The last 60 days are when the real preparation begins. So anything before that time is not representative, is it? This quote highlights a very important mismatch between the learning practices of Bangladesh and the UK. In other words, in Bangladesh, the past hadn't mattered till now. And since you cannot change the past, the students felt the rules of the game have changed after the game had started. And all of this created a massive data void, and to compensate for it, student, uh, schools created arbitrary forms of assessment that were unfair for both teachers and students. Now we move on to the next item, which is the ranking. So beyond tags, teachers were asked to rank their students in a rather peculiar way where no ties were allowed. It's important to know that no one knew why this requirement was put into place. And this, this requirement fundamentally changed how teachers actually assessed these grades. And as we will find out very soon, that the rank order plays a very crucial role in the ultimate formation of the imprint. Finally, we arrive at the third part of Act 2, which is the algorithmic standardization. So the tags and the ranking were created for one reason and one reason only, to do the standardization. But there are two things that make this very problematic. First, none of the participants, especially teachers, knew how this algorithm worked. No details were shared from the boards before grades were due in mid-June. Even the word algorithm doesn't appear in the correspondence. Second, and perhaps most importantly, no one knew that the only reason why this ranking, the non-tie-based ranking, was needed was to actually feed the algorithm with the right data. And that becomes very crucial later on. With all of these in mind, we now slowly move to Act 3. This act is about one day, the results day when the algorithmic results were released. So risking arrests and COVID, Bangladeshi students actually took to the streets um, and protested. However, unable to reach the faceless exam boards, the teachers became the target of abuse, as this teacher highlights, and I quote, 
I've never felt like a villain in 20 plus years of teaching. My students were blaming me. I felt like a punching bag. Problem is, I had no agency. It made me question my self-worth as a teacher. In this act, we get a taste of how the lived experiences will shape the imprint at the psychological level in people's minds. Finally, we focus on Act 4, which is the last one. And this largely focuses on grade revision. And, you know, on August 17, facing a lot of protests, the boards rescinded the grades globally. This is a once-in-a-lifetime event. And on the surface, everything appears to have a happy ending. So, you know, the protests had an effect. The boards dropped the algorithmic standardization. But we critically ask here, was the algorithmic effect truly undone? Here, the concept of the algorithmic imprint can actually help. One thing to remember here, that students were never regraded from scratch. So this is what happened. So originally, there were these three elements, the tag, the ranking, and the standardization, right? When they revised their grades, they took away just the standardization. But this ranking, right, this non-tie-based ranking remained a vestige of the algorithmic process right, which we know impacted how teachers graded and assigned the tags. So these two elements as part of the imprint foundationally impacted the end result, the revised grades, even when the algorithmic standardization was removed. And as this one teacher puts it, the ghost of the algorithm lived on even when the algorithm died. Like the remnant traces in a palimpsest, the imprint of an algorithm persisted even in its afterlife. Now, you may be wondering, how did the imprint help our participants? So this actually becomes clearer in the second round of interviews. And here's one way that it really helped them. It helped them trace the hidden sources of injustice even when things looked good on the surface. And the student encapsulates this point beautifully. Despite my grades improving, something always felt off. The imprint gives me a threat to connect the dots now. It helps me track the pain and points to who to hold accountable. Now, with these insights in mind, let's look at some implications, and there are four that we want to share. First, the concept of the imprint helps us reframe how we think about algorithmic impact by extending the locus of analysis and affording us to see the effects that would otherwise be less visible in the afterlife due to the absence of the algorithm. Second, we can use the reality of the hard imprints coming from algorithms to ethically guide deployments. For example, what would have happened if the off-ball algorithm developers were aware of the disproportionate impact their decisions would have on people on the other side of the world? Third, imprint awareness can allow us to better envision how upstream requirements such as historical data can cause harmful downstream impacts like unjust outcomes. Fourth, at a practical level, teams can actually enact this mindset through HCI techniques like scenario-based design to think through and mitigate the ill effects of different kinds of imprints. Finally, we would like to share some reflections. First, the concept of the imprint doesn't change the existing nature of algorithms. Algorithms have always been imprint laden. Second, it helps us to broaden what is typically considered for algorithmic impact. Third, it provides traction to ethical issues in the algorithm's afterlife, an unexplored area thus far, allowing us to see things that we wouldn't have been able to see before. Finally, let's wrap it up with a summary. We learned three things today. First, we learned what happened in Bangladesh and why they happened. Second, the lenses of the imprint helped us see how the removal of the standardization did not mean that the effects were undone. Finally, I think if we are not imprint aware, then we may struggle to tackle a future where more of these algorithms get discontinued, yet their harmful effects persist. Finally, some acknowledgement. And in this project, frankly, wouldn't be possible without the bravery and commitment of our participants. Thank you so much for engaging with us. I want to share a note to them in Bengali. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to Abrar, who was a superstar community liaison. Uh, thanks to all these individuals and these organizations for their support throughout different parts of the project. And finally, I hope you'll check out the paper. It has a lot more analysis and in-depth quotes 
Uh, thank you so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you at FACT 2022.